Tonight, well, how about a little diversity in tech? That's right. It's a whole diversity in tech edition of Tech News Tonight, which is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 241, recorded Monday, November 24th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace recently launched the latest version of their platform, Squarespace 7, which has a completely redesigned interface, integrations with Getty Images, and Google Apps, new templates, and an incredible feature called Cover Pages. Try the new Squarespace at squarespace.com and enter the offer code TECHNIGHT at checkout and you'll get 10% off. Hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Lane, and this is a special edition of Tech News Tonight. On this special edition of our show, we are covering diversity in technology. Some people say there's not enough. And here to get right into this topic is our guest, Selena Larson, writer with The Daily Dot. And Selena, I don't think we've been with us since you moved over to The Daily Dot. You were formerly with uh, Read Write. Yes, this is my first Tech News Tonight since being a Daily Dot writer. So thank you so much for having me. Well, thanks for being here. Uh, we thought of you uh, right away when we decided, okay, we're, we've got we've got some year-end specials that we're going to do uh, the week of Christmas because the Twit Studio uh, will not be open. So we're shooting a few things ahead of time. And we thought, well, that's certainly a great topic, certainly because it's been an interesting year for diversity <laughs> in tech, specifically covering topics like sexism, harassment of women online, inequality, uh, which you've written both for The Daily Dot and as a reporter for Read Write. So uh, let's start off with volunteer diversity reports. All the big companies were doing it. I'm not exactly sure who was first. Was it Apple? Google. But, okay. And, and <laughs> it... it one of the interesting things about diversity in tech is it's 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 awesome when a company uh, will will put forth uh, these numbers, but it also shows us that there's a surprising lack of diversity, um, even at large companies that in many cases are are seen as you know forward thinking and and certainly modern. So how mm -hmm. bad is it? So. I mean, it's pretty standard across the industry. Like I said, Google was the first one to release their diversity data, and it came on the heels of a lot of pressure from, from uh, publications and different people calling for diversity data. data. Um, and it's actually kind of standard across all the large companies, 70, 30 men to women, um, and majority um, white or Asian workers, between 2 and 3% uh, Latino and um, African-American workers as well. Um, so it was, Google really kicked off the trend and then all of these large tech companies sort of followed suit and all of them said that there was a lot of work to do. There are a lot of, um, things that they need to change, a lot of things that they should focus on. And, um, and yeah, I see that you're looking at Apple's data right now. Um, Apple and, uh, Amazon were both, um, they both had, uh, seemingly higher reports of, of, um, Latino and, um, black workers. Um, and a lot of that, uh, they also included their retail workers. So like people at the Apple store and then in the Amazon, um, the, the retail for Amazon as well, their warehouse workers. Um, so it wasn't necessarily all technical. So they also, a lot of these companies broke it down by technical workforce. And I think Twitter was actually the one with the smallest uh, number of women on their technical workforce. I want to say it was about 9% um, female versus 91% male. Um, and that's kind of, uh, another indicator too is this technical workforce. It's like, you know, engineering, design, that, um, that workforce is even more imbalanced on, in terms of gender. So I guess my question is the diversity reports are not only sort, sort of just interesting, but really paint a picture of, hey, you know, there are a lot of companies where you'd think there should be a lot more women or, 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 or uh, you know, a greater, you know, diversity in, in race and, and, and uh, with more minority representation. But you know, none of us are running HR hiring divisions for these large companies. I mean, how much does knowing this information really change the scope of how, you know, you know, the, the that 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 gender and and diversity is broken down within a company like Twitter, for example. So I think what a lot of this shows us is um, perhaps maybe they weren't necessarily thinking about it on this level now that it's all made public. And I also think it's cool too. It wasn't just large public companies that released their diversity data. It was also like Polyvore and Pinterest, Pandora. There were a handful of um, of smaller companies or even startups that that released their data and said, "Hey, you know, this is." This is something that we're really focused on. This is what we're working towards. And, um, 
even though we weren't called upon necessarily publicly to release its data, they are. And so I think this is kind of signaling a shift um, in in how people are going to think about hiring, hopefully. And now that it's public, uh, the public is going to be able to look at this and say, oh, hey, this is what your diversity statistics were in 2014, 2015, 2016. Further, further down the line, they'll have a starting point and sort of a barometer of, of the work that they're doing. They'll be able to say, well, you know, like we had all this work to do when we first released it. This is how far we've come. And they'll be able to measure that. Um, and I think that this is hopefully going to sort of act as a catalyst to have people start thinking a little bit more um, about their about their perhaps unconscious bias, which is uh, plays a large part in, in hiring talent when somebody just sort of assumes that that these biases that they have in their in their mind or unconsciously or not um, play a part into hiring. So um, so hopefully this is going to really encourage a lot of companies to, to think about that in the future. You know, some Sorry, the Sarah. Yes. Let me just interrupt. Uh, Selena, your microphone's rubbing against your collar. Oh. So just uh, try to be aware of it. It's making Sorry about that. Noise. Okay, so a lot of company culture, one could argue, starts at the top. Uh, and this was a year that some people who are running large companies uh, said things that were uh, taken to be missteps, uh, so, uh, particularly when it comes to the gender issue. Uh, one uh, case that I can think of off the top of my head is Satya Nadella, who has been the CEO of Microsoft less than a year who was asked about, it was, it was sort of what, empowerment uh, with women within uh, companies and, and how to you know, grow. And he had a comment along the lines of trusting karma and things will just sort of work out. And yeah, a lot of people took that extremely, uh, uh, you know, they were extremely offended about it. He had apologized afterwards quickly. But he's certainly not the only person, um, certainly a man who's, who's running a large company, who has said something that has really you know, rubbed people the wrong way. How much, how much do you think you know, we, we can kind of shake some of this off as, well, you know, he just sort of said something that you shouldn't have said in the moment and you can backtrack. And how much of that do you really think affects uh, forward motion for, for equality? No, I think a lot of times, first well, first of all, it actually came out later that um, this sort of is Microsoft's standard of, of asking for raises, you know, just you don't ask for them and your and your managers will reward you for great behavior. So I think that that was, um, in, in, in one way, it was him thinking of, well, this is how we do it internally at my company and not necessarily uh, in the industry at large. Um, I think, so that was, that is one thing that came out after. However, I think when things like this are said, it sort of, shows people and in, in, or shows people that people in leadership positions aren't necessarily clued into the larger <laughs> the larger world outside of, of you know mm -hmm. their company or their bubble etc cetera, etc cetera. um I, I think it was great that he did acknowledge that he shouldn't have said that and he did apologize and it was actually on stage at the grace hopper conference when the, this comment was made and the interviewer who was who was uh chatting with him um, from harvey mudd college she said actually <laughs> um you should ask for a raise, and here are some tips to ask for a raise. So I think what was good about his remarks, actually, was that it sparked that conversation um, on a, a very large scale. I mean, a lot of people covered this, and a lot of people were talking about it. And so in turn, they were having, um, they provided resources for their employee, for employees to ask for a raise. And so it was something that, that sort of sparked a conversation. Uh, also, too, I feel like there have been um, multiple instances of, of uh, things that have come out from startup leaders as well. I believe there was... Um, a few months ago, there was this, this story about uh, a guy, was he's from Australia, giving a presentation about why you should hire more women because they're, they're cheaper, they'll work harder, things like that. Just kind of these off-the-cuff remarks that are uh, so often either said behind closed doors or even on stage in public that aren't really thought through fully. Uh, and it's kind of one of those times where um, I, you, you hear this a lot, right? Like st step into somebody else's shoes, look at an issue from someone else's perspective. Um, and I think while it's kind of not great that a CEO <laughs> says that this is the advice that he's going to give, it also provides that insight and, and lets other people think of the issue in a way that they might not have thought of before because so many people are talking about it and um, talking about how things can be different. You know, on the subject of uh, of diversity and equality, uh, Apple is one of the companies that uh, who had 
two large keynotes uh, this fall in September for the iPhone and, and October for uh, the new iPad and Apple Watch. And, you know, it, 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 definitely no women uh, on stage during that time. We should probably point out, obviously, Tim Cook has publicly come out as a uh, gay after those announcements. They, it certainly wasn't part of uh, Apple's uh, device offerings, but he said that being gay, this is his words, being gay has given me a deeper understanding of what it means to be in the minority. How, how do you, what do you make of this? I, and in general, there's been some backlash, certainly, but in general, it seems like uh, this, uh, you know, t- Tim Cook's admission has been has been met with a lot of praise. You know, he's, uh, you know, it's, it's a brave thing to do. What effect do you think this had on Apple's business? I mean, Apple's, you know, a huge company in the business to make as much money as possible. Is it too early to tell? You know, I am, I think it is a little bit too early to tell, but I would point out that Tim Cook, when he released diversity data for Apple, he did include um, LGBT folks in part of that diversity. He also included um, people with disabilities as part of that diversity. So he says that it's not just your race or gender that makes a workplace diverse. It's also these other aspects of your person, other aspects of your identity. And Apple, he he said that Apple really supports that. Um, As far as the business goes, I am not exactly sure if any of his public remarks are going to have any impact on the business. I mean, Apple is a giant corporation and he is a CEO that has led the company to tremendous, tremendous success in revenue. And, and I think that um, I think that those values that he has play a part in building Apple. And also in the last uh the last, I feel, I feel like it was a few months ago, they actually updated their um, leadership page and they added um, some women and, and people of color on the diversity page and or on their leadership page. And so Apple, you can tell that Apple really takes this kind of thing seriously. Um, as far as having no women or people of color on the keynote stage, which I follow <laughs> regularly, it's something that I'm always looking out for. I think that they could do a better job of that. I mean, Apple's head of retail is a woman. And I think that um, especially with the upcoming launch of the iWatch is a, is a perfect perfect example to, or a perfect opportunity to have her, um, show that off and talk about, you know, Apple's, Apple's retail plans and Apple's, uh, their, their goals with the iWatch, which is, you know, a little bit of, a little bit of fashion, a little bit of technology. And, um, and so I think that would be a great opportunity. So I hope, um, moving forward that Apple will eventually have those leaders on stage because I think we were talking about this earlier, but a large part of, of, um, diversity in Silicon Valley is having leaders sort of, be representative of the people that use your products. Uh, and, you know, any one of these technologies, whether it's Google or Apple or Facebook or Twitter, the people that are using the technology come from a variety of backgrounds, both men and women, you know, all sorts of sexual orientations, all different races. And I think that in order for, you know, companies to really represent their their consumer base and, and they need to have that representation in their company too. You know, something that that might not be uh, represented as much in a company that makes apps for people of, of all uh, genders, races, and ages is old people. Tech companies <laughs> are mostly a bunch of young folks. So what about ageism? You know, it's, I actually have this friend who recently left San Francisco. He so triumphantly left and said, you can't work in tech if you're over 40 and I'm almost 40 and I'm out of here. And I thought, well, that's depressing. And then I thought, huh, he kind of has a point though. The workforce is getting older. This is not actually part of diversity reports. And I'm sure part of that is, you know, privacy issues. But do you think it should be? Do do we care if, uh, you know, a certain amount of tech workers at Facebook say are under 25 or over 35? You know, I think that's a great point. Um, It's something that is not as discussed as much as um, the gender or race imbalance. Um, But it's kind of true. You know, you hear you hear remarks a lot about how somebody is trying to find a new job if they're over a certain age, if they have graying hair. I think I was I was even walking down the street once in San Francisco and somebody said that they ended up it was like one of those overheard moments in the traffic, but they said that they um, changed their LinkedIn profile picture because their profile picture showed them with gray hair. And it, they thought that that impacted um, the people's decisions that they were talking to about getting a job. Mm. So you hear these remarks all the time. And I think that uh, it is something that you sh- that people need to focus on. And it is, again, one of those uh, biases, whether unconscious or not, that that, you know, these young people that drop out of college or these young people that, you know, have have engineering degrees, recent graduates, that they're more uh, adept with technology or they have better ideas. 
um, and and people sort of forget that um, experience is experience in the tech industry is hugely important as well. Um, so I think that there are um, that is a conversation that is is happening, and I think that that's something that's that's very important as well. So um, whether or not more companies are going to start talking about that remains to be seen. But I think some of the initiatives that a lot of these companies are doing, especially uh, with veterans and um, uh, w women going back to work after having children, um, I think that that a lot of uh, a lot of companies are are trying to do that. And um, and in that aspect, you will be recruiting um, older older people for your workforce, which of course, as part of the community that uses your products, not all of them are twenty something, you know, <laughs> hackers. So. <laughs> yep, yep, that's true. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more uh, after the break about uh, diversity in the workforce and how technology companies are working towards more of it. But first, let's take a moment to thank Squarespace.com for sponsoring this episode of TN2, this very special episode, in fact. Squarespace just launched the latest version of their platform. It's Squarespace 7. It's a whole redesign interface, and it's faster and easier than ever to put together a professional website that looks good, works well, is going to impress everybody. Squarespace constantly improves their platform. So Squarespace 7 has things like easier editing. You can just live edit on one screen. You're not toggling between a site manager and a preview mode anymore. That makes it extremely handy to see what your website looks like as you're creating it. You can even preview designs in device mode so you can see how your Squarespace site is going to look on tablets and mobile or the web or a variety of places that people might access it. You also have instant access to professional stock photography from Getty. Squarespace now uh, allows direct purchases inside its platform right in there from Getty Images at just $10 each for your site. You might need, you might need this you know beautiful image of I don't know, the Taj Mahal, and you're not going there anytime soon. You just buy it for 10 bucks. Instant branded email setup with Google Apps is new as well. Now you have branded email for your small business automatically set when you sign up for a Squarespace account. They just throw it right in there. And there are templates designed for specific professions. Maybe you're a musician or, or an artist or, or you've got a restaurant. Squarespace has designed category-specific templates that cater to the requirements for particular industry groups. And that's really helpful as well. It's really easy to use, but if you want help, Squarespace has live chat and email support 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And there are self-help articles and video workshops that you can browse at your leisure. Some of the video workshops have been extremely, extremely helpful to me, especially when I get into DNS issues. And I have many times, which is not even Squarespace fault, but they, they've got good tutorials for me. Plans start at just $8 a month and includes a free domain name if you sign up for a year and hosting is included. Squarespace takes care of the hosting so you don't have to. You can start a free two-week trial, no credit card required, completely free. Just start building your website. Take a couple weeks and see how great it looks. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code TECHNIGHT. That's T-E-C-H-N-I-G-H-T and you'll get 10% off. And to begin using Squarespace 7, if you're an existing customer, you just go to the settings tab and you activate all the new features. Thanks to Squarespace for their support of Tech News Tonight. Squarespace, start here, go anywhere. All right, we are getting back into our diversity TN2 special with guest Selena Larson, writer over at The Daily Dot. Okay, let's talk a little bit about <sighs> online harassment of women. I'm particularly talking about Gamergate, which we have discussed on TN2 in the past. The idea that um, there is... <sighs> I mean, I don't know, Selena, what would we even call this sort sort of women shaming going on kind of under the guise of what do they call themselves? Social journal, social, what do they call themselves? Social, social justice, warriors? social justice <laughs> warriors. Correct. What is going on here? What, what, what do you think has happened? Why, why is there so much vitriol that seems to be, uh, you know, being hurled at women, has it always been this way or is there something about the anonymity of the internet and, and services like Twitter that make it worse? So, yeah, so Gamergate is an interesting thing that's happening. Um, <laughs> I think a lot of it, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very, it's a very tangled mess. It's uh, strangely hard to understand occasionally, but it's basically um, people who want to diversify games, you know, make, um, make more female characters, make, um, make 
more characters available to to different people in games and and calling out um, when games are bad or don't represent the the community that plays them, um, et cetera, et cetera. So essentially, um, what happened is it's it was sparked from a weird scenario. I don't really even want to get into to, to, to Gamergate necessarily. I guess we can focus on the harassment issue. Um, but if you search it, there is tremendous amount of hate and most of it is targeted to very high profile women in um, the gaming and tech community. Um, it's awful. And I think that uh, if I understood why this was happening or if anyone really understood like, the, the backlash behind it, I think we would have a, a better way of handling it. Um, I'm not, I think though that you are, you are right in, in, Twitter or Secret or any of these other like anon anonymous, anonymous apps that are kind of all the rage these days, they do provide people with that sort of sense of, oh, well, I'm not necessarily putting my name behind this comment or I can, I can post this and people don't really know who I am. And um, it's sort of that, that internet shield, right? Like <laughs> you can say kind of whatever you want. Um, and, and there is, you know, the, uh, a bit of a free speech thing there too. Like you can say whatever you want. The problem comes in when these platforms um, like 4chan or Twitter or um, Reddit don't necessarily respond to things, um, to, to this abuse uh, in a way that they should. Um, there was also, of course, that uh, celebrity photo leak that they compromised the iCloud accounts and put it on Reddit and 4chan, uh, which was subsequently shut down on Reddit. And there was a lot of hate speech existing on there too, especially towards women and these celebrities. So this seems kind of like the last few months have been really rough um, <laughs> as far as um, as far as hate or or, or anonymous uh, anonymous actions online. Um, but what's good is I think that a lot more of these companies are are speaking out and are are trying to figure out how to deal with this because it's inevitably going to happen when you have these platforms that you can use anonymously. Um, but you know, Reddit took down what they called the fappening subreddit. Mm -hmm. uh, 4chan ended up um, basically blacklisting a lot of the Gamergate, uh, a lot of the Gamergate content. And of course, they subsequently went to this other thing called Infinity Chan, 8chan. Um, but there's also, um, but Twitter also, too, is doing some really great things uh, in order to uh, Im improve the network and improve the safety and privacy of people on the network, including partnering with uh, Women's Action in the Media for a tool to help people report uh, harassment on Twitter. They can actually report other people being harassed, which is something that you haven't been able to do on Twitter historically, and which was one of the big issues that people had. Uh, if their friend was getting harassed, um, they couldn't um, they couldn't report it. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, so they are taking strides, and this is this is sort of a Twitter's way of saying, okay, how can we how can we deal with this better? We're going to partner with an organization that can can help us with this. Um, so I think that that's in, like that's making really great steps on like Reddit and 4chan and Twitter and all of these platforms. Um, even Whisper, Secret, there are um, there are things in place on those networks as well that say, oh, are you bullying somebody? Um, this your language will be banned. This isn't acceptable on this platform. Uh, so I think, um, so I think, especially just in this last year, there's definitely been a rise of those apps. But there's also been um, a lot of changes that people are making to try and combat those harassment. If only those fill-in uh, sheets, if you're wanting to report harassment, were not so cumbersome to fill out. I actually did that recently, and it, you know, it, I got to the point where it was like, do you feel physically threatened? I did not which is probably why I thought, oh, this is, you know, I have to enter a lot of stuff just to say this person's, you know, being a jerk and I want their their uh, account to come down. But yes, it's absolutely moving in the right direction, especially since Twitter has been criticized in the past for, for kind of being a little too hands-off when it comes to people literally fearing for their own safety. Let's talk a little bit about... The idea that not enough women are programming, not enough women are interested in learning to code, not enough, not a, there aren't enough uh, girls early on in life that are encouraged to to have those skills. Do you think, and, and this is the sort of thing that, I mean, it's so prevalent in the conversation about tech today, but, but is us talking about it actually changing much? Uh, especially since I think this starts, you know, pretty early in life for girls. Yeah, absolutely. I think that a lot of initiatives and organizations are really taking this seriously. And I think that they're doing great work. I mean, there's Girls Who Code, Black Girls, Black Girls Who Code. Um, there's Code.org, which is a giant initiative um, that's trying to get kids of all ages and both genders interested in coding. And I think that there's a huge push to get young girls interested in engineering and programming. It's not the only issue. It's not that there's 
what is called a pipeline problem where there aren't enough girls interested in coding. The problem happens even further down the line, right? When you get to the university level and girls feel intimidated or or young women feel intimidated by um, their male colleagues who have been programming since they were seven years old. Or when you get into the office and you have a job as an engineer and the culture is not a good fit for you. Mm -hmm. Um, Women actually leave careers in um, technical careers in engineering much more frequently than men do after 10 years. I think it's like 41% of women leave careers in engineering, whereas 17% of men do after a decade. And that kind of says a lot, you know, that you get to that point where it's like, oh, can you really take this anymore? And so many women, so many women get to that point and it's, it's just so stressful because there's, they're not, there's a problem of the, of the pipeline. And it's great that a lot of young women are getting educated on this. They're really focusing on this. Um, But then there's also on the other side of it, as women that are already in the workplace, having to deal with um, deal with different colleagues or or different stereotypes or or things that they're experiencing that are actually pushing them out of technology, not because they don't want to be programmers or engineers, but because they don't really want to deal with the culture or how people are treated or things like that. Do you think that uh, women in, in, in big positions of power, Sheryl Sandberg, the COO at Facebook, for example, Marissa Meyer, the CEO of Yahoo, who have both kind of been criticized for Sheryl Sandberg famously wrote a book called Lean In, which is all about the empowerment of women. And a lot of people say, yeah, you have a lot of money and privilege, though. So you're kind of giving people uh, advice that that they can't necessarily take. Marissa Meyer built a nursery inside her office at Yahoo or something like that. And people said, well, you know, that wouldn't that be nice? I'd, you could just bring your kid to your nursery that you built for yourself because you've got all this money and you've got all this privilege. Are, it seems as though uh, women in positions of power in general is, is, is great for the advancement of women in positions of power. But how do we deal with some of the, this advice that is unrealistic for so many women? Yeah, um, that's, that's that's something interesting. So I think it's fantastic when any anyone <laughs> wants to talk about um, their success story and wants to be a leader and wants to be a role model for other people coming up in the industry. I think that's fantastic. Um, I think it's great when women have very positive stories about their experiences in technology. Um, I know, you know, most of the people that I talk to who are women in technology have at least experienced some sort of negative interaction. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, but I think that when, when you're given advice that only consists of, you know, just, just be yourself, just lean in, just do the thing that you have been doing this entire time. And eventually it'll happen. It's almost the same as, you know, Satya saying, Oh, karma, um, right. karma will, ca- karma will come and support you. And, um, you know, while that does work for some women, some women do have, um, the tremendous ability to be able to have a nanny to look after their children so they can go to work or lean in like Cheryl Sandberg or, you know, have their own nursery, um, which is great. And I'm very happy that they can do that, but that doesn't necessarily apply to everybody. And so I think what that when we're having these conversations about women in tech, it's important to think about that. Um, if you're speaking on a panel or if you are um, giving advice to other women, that not necessarily every woman had the same privileges or the same opportunities that you have. And it's great to share your experiences, but again, it's also it's also probably important to think about the flip side of things, right? Because in the audience of um, these engineers or soon to be engineers or, or college students, you know, there are likely some that come from poorer families or single moms or um, people that have experienced uh, harassment in the workplace and don't know how to deal with it. So, um, so I think that, it's really important to to think about it from all sides. Again, it's this really like think about it from somebody else's perspective and think about think about it from there. But I do also think that it's very important to talk about the positive things and positive interactions that women have in technology um, because it should like these every woman should have positive experiences. And this is what really encourages those young women to get involved in tech is hearing from role models and hearing from leaders that um, they have had great experiences and it is a career that they would suggest going into. Yeah, I know that you uh, are, you're, you're, you're very much a women in tech advocate and sometimes you are uh, vocal about <laughs> how you are disappointed with you know some of, some of the advice that, you know, what's even women give other women. In fact, you've uh, referred to them as puff panels for women in tech. And, and and this sort of refers to, again, kind of sort of vague advice that 
it, 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 it seems to always kind of come back to just do your best and eventually you'll be rewarded, which, you know, if you're a woman and you've got a glass ceiling above you, you, you don't know how to break through that glass ceiling. You, there's, there's, it, it seems like there needs to be measured, uh, you know, actionable item advice that so many of us just kind of go, yeah, we, we don't really get that. <laughs> do you think that, you know, it's, it's because many women just don't have the answers and so we're kind of all having the same conversation without any, any clear solutions? You know, that that might be part of it. Absolutely. You know, because when people are invited to speak on the panel, the only thing that they can talk about is their own experience. Um, if they haven't experienced something that's very negative, then they can't really talk about it. But I I think that not being truthful with an audience or not being open and, and, and sincere and saying, look, this can be crappy. And if somebody asks, oh, I've had this crappy situation at my job and I don't know how to deal with it. And I think that you're somebody that I would really look up to and respect. How would you deal with this particular situation? I think that's a perfectly valid thing for somebody to ask. And um, I think when the same advice is doled out over and over again, it doesn't really help anyone. Mm. And I think that um, even if somebody doesn't necessarily have a particular experience, it might be interesting or helpful for them to anticipate these questions and say, okay, maybe somebody doesn't have this experience, the same experience as I do. I would like to think about what I would do if I was in a situation that was negative. Um, because it's not like, not everybody can quit their job. Not everybody mm -hmm. can say, can choose, um, can choose to, to, to go somewhere else. I mean, that's not an option for a lot of people. A lot of people have, they're, they're in their dream job, but they're getting treated poorly. So, so what is that like, how do you really weigh those opportunities and those decisions? So I think that just, I mean, just like men do, I mean, going on a panel to talk, oops, sorry, to talk about women in technology, um, they have to think about their, like what they're saying. I think the same goes for women. But I do think that it's great to talk about positive experiences. I guess that's the last question I have before we let you go, Selena. And it's been so great to talk to you for the last half hour or so about diversity. Is you know, 2014 will probably go down as one of the uh, worst years for uh, you know diversity and, and people kind of kumbayaing and loving each other and, and being very supportive. Where do we go as a tech community from here? You know, what does 2015 look like? Is it is it really a matter of think before you speak, uh, executive uh, men in charge? Do we, what, what have we learned? You know, I'd honestly argue that it might be one of the best years for diversity in technology because people are finally speaking up. This isn't a problem that all of a sudden blossomed in, you know, 2013, 2014. This has been around for decades. Yeah. And you read blog posts from women who came up in the 1980s in Silicon Valley and their experiences with harassment and, and being treated poorly. And they were awful and appalling and They've never spoken about them until now because now we're at the point where people can can speak up and speak their truth and speak honestly with other other people and say, you know, this behavior is unacceptable. And it sucks having to hear about it and it sucks that people get treated like this. But I think that it's good that we're at the point where people are confident enough to talk about it and discuss what it's like being a minority in technology, being a woman in technology, being a woman who gets treated poorly. So while it seems like there's been a lot of news and a lot of crappy stuff that's happened this year, I think it's going to be a turning point moving forward with all of the companies releasing their diversity data. It's finally a talking point. People are willing to discuss it and are being open. So I think it's really great. And I'm hoping that moving forward, we'll begin to have change and companies and cultures will start embracing things and understanding how they can um, recognize those unconscious, unconscious biases, recognize um, certain behaviors in the workplace that aren't necessarily welcoming, recognize how we can retain women from leaving the workforce, recognize how we can retain people from different backgrounds and races in technology and begin to build companies that really represent the people who use technology. So I think it's great as as much as we don't like listening to it, as much as we don't like seeing our friends harassed on Twitter, as much as we don't like to talk about it even, now we're finally seeing a sort of an open dialogue, which I think is fantastic. And moving forward, I think that this open dialogue will affect change. 
Selena Larson, I could not have said it better myself. Selena <laughs> now writes for the Daily Dot. She's been a frequent guest of TN2 over the over the last year, uh, formerly of Read Write. Thank you so much for being with us for this special diversity edition of Tech News Tonight. And before I let you go for the Thanksgiving holiday, and actually Christmas holiday because some of you will be seeing the show uh, in a couple of weeks, remind folks where they can keep up with all of your work. Yeah, absolutely. I am on uh, Daily Dot, so of course visit our website, and at Selena Larson on Twitter. Excellent. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, that does it for this special edition of Tech News Tonight. It's a lot of fun. I think we're going to do a few more of these, actually. So we're keep you satiated Christmas week when the Twit studio will be dark, as we call it in the business. You can, of course, subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write us with feedback at TN2 at twit.tv. And, of course, you can watch on regular times live on weekdays at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern time. I'm Sarah Lane, and thanks so much for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.